Well, good morning. It's good to be back in the house of the Lord. I hear the Lord was in the house last night, and God moved and spoke through the preacher, and we're thankful for that, and we look forward to the Lord speaking a word through him today as well. And so, Dr. Dean Hall, we're grateful that you accepted the invitation that you are coming today as the man of God to break the bread of life open for us. Let's pray together, and our worship team will come. Heavenly Father, Lord, we just love you, and God, we just praise you, Father, today for who you are and for all that you have done, you continue to do. And Lord, we know, Father, that God, unless the Lord builds the house, they labor in vain that build it. And today, Father, we want to hear from you. So God, I pray you'd take your messenger, God, you'd loose his tongue, that Father, you'd anoint him and just preach through him today, that we could hear from heaven, it would move our hearts. May you be exalted in this place, in Jesus' name, amen. Good morning, everyone. Why don't we stand and worship the Lord together?
have to be embarrassed, you can raise your hands a little bit, let it go, you know? We're all friends here.
thank him that we're here, that we're alive, that we're able, and we just we continue to be amazed by him each day. Right now we're going to go into our prayer time. If you feel led to kneel here at the altar, if you feel the need to sit, stand, raise your hands, just have a close time with him right now. Spend a few minutes praying.
us. We pray that you'll bless us in all that we're doing, especially in our ministry, Lord. We pray that we will always be walking in your will and your plan, Lord. We just thank you for all that you are in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, good morning, everybody, and uh, worship team, thank you so very much for blessing our hearts, and uh, I, I, I just want to say I love worshiping with worshipers. Um, man, I've been to so many churches and preached in so many places, and everybody just, sometimes they just sit there like a knot on a log, you know, and are, are we not excited about what, what we're singing about and who we're singing about, and man, so I just... I just praise the Lord for you guys, and it's great to worship in a place where we can just worship the Lord and, and just love Him and uh, just be all about His business. And uh, worship team, I, I don't know who picked that last song, but I don't think you could have picked a better song to go with what God put on my heart uh, to preach this morning, and, and only the Lord can do that. And uh, I also understand through your professor that, that this was kind of grade day. For the worship team. Well, I'm not your professor, but I would give you an A today. So, uh, whatever. Uh, you know, um, I want you to take your Bibles this morning, and I want you to turn with me to Luke chapter 22. And our text verse is going to be one verse, but then we're going to stay right with the Word. We're actually going to be in Luke 22, as well as John 21 this morning. And so I, I know I'm standing between you and lunch, and I want to do a little preaching teaching today, kind of like we did last night as well. But I want you to see some things from the text, because I know that in ministry, there are many times that we disappoint the Lord. There are many times that we don't do what maybe we ought to be doing. But is there hope, and is there forgiveness, and is there restoration and is there a word of encouragement? We just sang that this morning. That last song was so powerful. And I believe it's going to speak to our heart through the message today as well. Luke chapter 22, verse 54. Let's stand in honor of reading the word of God. Having arrested him, Jesus, they led him and brought him into the high priest's house. Now notice this, but Peter followed at a distance. I want to share a message with you this morning entitled, Following at a Distance. Father, I pray that you would help us to understand your word today. Thank you for how powerful your word is. I pray that you would open our hearts to receive it, that we would apply it. Thank you, Lord, for the amazing grace that, that was demonstrated in order to save us. But thank you, Lord, for the grace that keeps us and that restores us and forgives us when we fall short. So, Lord, help us today. I pray for anyone who might be following you at a distance, that this would be the day that they would recommit their lives totally to Jesus Christ. Thank you, Father, for blessing us and being among us and we give you the praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated this morning. Now, as we get started, I want us to establish the context of this passage of Scripture. How many of you know that a text without a context is a pretext? I've heard some of the weirdest messages preached before when somebody reads one verse of Scripture and then runs off for 45 minutes down a rabbit trail and you have no idea, it has no meaning back to the Scripture. I know that you've been trained better than that. I know that you are trained to deal with a passage of Scripture. So that's what we want to do. So I hope you have not closed your Bibles this morning out of Luke chapter 22 and then eventually to John chapter 21. What's going on in this passage of Scripture, this verse that we have read. It is the night before the crucifixion of the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus has met with His disciples at the Passover meal, 
And in the midst of that meal, he institutes, he cuts the new covenant. He institutes through the, the bread and through the cup, he institutes what would be what we call communion, what we call the Lord's Supper. But it would be his way of instituting with his Jewish disciples the new covenant spoken of by Jeremiah chapter 31. The Bible says they sang a song. I've heard preachers say before, well, they sang victory in Jesus and then they left. No, they sang out of the Hallel, Psalms 113 through 118. And usually at the end of a Passover, it was that last part of Psalm 118. They then made their way across the Kidron Valley to the Garden of Gethsemane. The Garden of Gethsemane was a place of delight for Jesus. But this particular night, it was going to become a, pa a place of immense torture, immense crush for our sin because Jesus was beginning the process of bearing your sin and mine at Calvary. Now I want you to understand something. I want you to understand that Gethsemane was not only a place, it was a thing. It was a place where olives were grown and then crushed and then that oil used there exclusively in the Garden of Gethsemane was for the temple. And all of the things that the oil, the olive oil was produced and used for at the temple. I want you to see a Gethsemane. It is a device used to crush the olives. This picture, look at this picture. This is one that is uh, found, it's a replica that's found in Jerusalem today. But you'll notice the long pole with weights on the end of it. And the olives would be crushed in a mill, kind of a millstone, and then the pulp would be put in baskets and layered together. You can see that on the far end toward the top of the picture. And then that, that weight, that pole would crush down on those baskets producing the beautiful, beautiful olive oil. Now here's what's interesting. There were always three crushings of the olives for, to produce the olive oil. The first crushing of the olive oil, that first oil that would come out of the crushed pulp was used for anointing at the temple. The second pressing, the second time they would crush the olives, that basket, those baskets of olives, that oil was used for the lights, for the menorah and for the lights and lamps in the temple itself. And then the third crushing of the oil, that oil would be used for medicinal purposes. You can imagine the priest had bloody hands all day with all the sacrifices that were going on on a daily basis. They needed cleaning products. I want to say something to you. I don't think it's any accident that Luke records that three different times Jesus prayed in the Garden of Gethsemane only to find his disciples sound asleep. Three different times, ladies and gentlemen, Jesus was feeling the crush for our sin. In the same place where the olives were crushed to produce the oil, and Luke says, look at verse 44 in your text, that he began to sweat great drops of blood. It's a, a thing called hematidrosis, where you're under such pressure that the capillaries on top of the skin actually burst. Here is the Lord Jesus Christ beginning to feel the crush and the weight of your sin and my sin, which he would bear the next day on Calvary. And here he is being crushed three times. What does it say to us? It says to us, he is the anointed one. He is the light of the world. And He is the only one who can cleanse us from our sin. Amen? And He was crushed three times in that garden. And then look at the first part of our verse today. Verse 54. It says that after His arrest in that garden, that He was taken to the high priest. Now John says something very interesting. Jesus was taken first to Annas and then to the high priest who was Caiaphas. Let me explain that a little bit. Annas was the actual high priest 
from 7 A.D. to about 14 A.D. And it was kind of like the Supreme Court justices. They were high priests for life. But the Romans didn't like him, so they ousted him. So Annas was really the high priest in the eyes of the Jewish people, but he was ousted by the Romans and he was succeeded by four of his sons and finally his son-in-law, a guy by the name of Joseph ben Caiaphas. So what would happen? Jesus would be taken first to Annas. They shared, uh, the whole complex was together. You can kind of see parts of it in, in Jerusalem today. But Annas would be on one side, Caiaphas would be on the other side, separated by the courtyard where I believe Peter was. We'll see that later in our text. He's taken to Annas first so a charge of blasphemy could be filed against him. Then he is taken to Caiaphas, the high priest, where Jesus will then go as, through a series of six illegal trials, both at the hands of the Jewish religious leaders and the hands of of the Romans. But Caiaphas was the ringleader. Caiaphas was the one who charged Jesus with blasphemy earlier back in the chapters of John. Here's what I find to be very interesting about that. In 1990, a road crew was, was building a road in South Jerusalem and they stumbled upon, you can't dig anywhere in Jerusalem by the way without finding something related to the Bible they stumbled upon a burial cave. Inside that burial cave, guys, were 12 ossuaries, or what the Jewish people call, they call them ossuaries or bone boxes. In other words, the body would decay, and then about a year later, you'd take the bones and put them in these decorative boxes. They were about the size, the longest bone in the body is the femur bone in the leg, so they were about that big, if you can kind of imagine that. But I want you to see this next picture. They found a very decorative bone box or ossuary in that burial cave. And twice inscribed on the burial box was the name Joseph ben Caiaphas. Many of the Jewish archaeologists say, wow, this has got to be the Caiaphas of the New Testament. This has got to be the one who was the ringleader in condemning Jesus to death. So here's what's interesting. The Israeli archaeologists take this decorative bone box to the Israeli museum. It's there today in Jerusalem. But guess what they did with the remains? The rabbis take the remains. Now there's just dust in the box, so they take the remains, the dust of the bones of this Yosef ben Caiaphas, and they take them and they bury them in the Jewish cemetery on the Mount of Olives. Now stay with me. Where does Zechariah say that Jesus is returning someday? To the Mount of Olives. Only God could have orchestrated after 2,000 years to find that dude's body and to have him relocated to the Mount of Olives so that someday when King Jesus comes, he will be raised to stand before him and have to declare, you, sir, indeed are the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Only God could do that after 2,000 years. So now Jesus is arrested. Now he is being charged with blasphemy. Now he is about to go through the whole ordeal that will lead to the cross. But where is Peter? Look at the last part of our verse. Following him at a distance. Following him afar off. I, the first principle that I, if we kind of get an outline here today, the first principle that I want us to talk about is Peter's failure. Peter's failure. Now, I want you to think about this with me. There's no doubt that Peter was a disciple. There is no doubt that this man was a faithful follower of Jesus Christ. I mean, he had been called out of his occupation as a fisherman. He had left it all for three years to follow Jesus. This is the man, remember in Matthew chapter 16? This is the man that declared, 
I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. This is a man that no doubt was a true follower and disciple of Jesus Christ. In fact, Jesus, remember what Jesus said? He asked that question, who do men say that I am? Well, some say you're like Elijah. Some say you're like John the Baptist or one of the other prophets. But who do you say that I am? And Peter says, you are the Christos, the son of the living God. And Jesus said, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, Simon son of Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And Jesus commends him. And he says, You are a small stone, but upon the fact that I am who you declare me to be, the Christ, the Son of the living God, I'm going to build my church. By the way, the church is not built on Peter. The church is built on the fact that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. But there's no doubt that this man was a disciple. But now we come to this passage of Scripture. Now Jesus is arrested. And by the way, the Bible says that all the disciples forsook him and fled. Not just Peter, but all of them. And now he's following at a distance. There may be somebody here today in this service and in your heart of hearts you would have to declare, you know Lord I, I, I think in my walk with you that I'm not as close as I need to be. I think I may be following you at a distance rather than that close, intimate, personal walk, personal relationship. Man, you know the difference. I know the difference. I've tried to do this thing in the power of the flesh. Anybody else say amen this morning? And I know the difference between doing it in the power of the flesh and walking with the Lord moment by moment, day by day. I know the difference. The Lord knows the difference. There have been times in my life where I could say, just like Peter, I was following the Lord Jesus at a distance. Now, I... I'll, I'll, I'll say this, I'm a disciple. I've given my life to Jesus. I've trusted in Him as my Savior. But there have been times when I've followed Him at a distance. Now I want you to see something in the very next verse. Look at verse 55. Because He, 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 he began as a disciple, now He's following the Lord at a distance. Look at the third step in this whole process. Now it affects His discernment. I want you to look at this. Now, when they had kindled a fire in the midst of the courtyard and sat down together, Peter sat among them? What? Peter, you're a disciple of Jesus Christ, and now you're sharing the fire with the enemy? Now you are kindling a fire among those who are the enemies of Christ? Do you see what happens to our discernment? When we begin to follow Jesus at a distance, we begin to make some of the craziest choices and craziest things that we choose to do because we're walking in the power of the flesh. And we begin to make errors in discernment. Man, across 45 years of ministry, and uh, Brother Fox, I know you know this too, across all these years of ministry, I've had people sit in my office and they say, boy, pastor, I really blew it. And they tell me what they did. And I'm thinking, what were you thinking? What in the world were you thinking when you decided to do that? Now, I, I loved on them and, and I prayed with them. But still, what happens when we begin to follow the Lord at a distance? It affects our discernment and our decisions and our choices. Here is Peter now kindling a fire with the enemies of Christ. And that led to the next step of his failure, his out-and-out -out denial. Look at it. He denied Jesus three times, just like Jesus said he would. A certain servant girl, verse 56, seeing him as he sat by the fire, looked intently at him and said, this man was also with him, but he denied him, saying, woman, I do not know him. Look at the second denial. Verse 58, And after a little while another saw him and said, You are of them. But Peter says, Man, I am not. 
Then after an hour had passed, another confidently affirmed, saying, Surely this fellow also was with him, for he is a Galilean. Why did they know he was a Galilean? Because he had a northern accent. The folks up in the north talk different than the folks down in the south. The folks in the north and northern Israel and the Galilee area had a different Jewish accent, Hebrew accent, than the folks in Jerusalem. They knew that he was a Galilean. You're one of his followers. But Peter says, man, I don't know what you are saying. Now the rock had become a pile of gravel. He began as a disciple. Then he began to follow the Lord at a distance. And then he, it was affecting his discernment. He started making crazy choices till finally he denied the Lord altogether. Now before we sit there and say, well, I'd never do that. I, I'd, I'd never deny the Lord Jesus. I submit to you that we do it all the time. We do it all the time. When we ought to witness for Jesus, but we don't. When we ought to say something and we don't say anything. When we ought to make a stand for the Lord Jesus and what's right and what's godly. And we don't do that. I submit to you that we do it all the time. I submit to you and myself included that I fail Him all the time and probably just about every day. And Somebody may, may be here today and you're thinking, man, that's the description of my life. I started out strong with the Lord. And then I started getting a little bit away from the Lord, following at a distance, and it started affecting the choices that I've made. And, and now there have been times that, that, that people don't even know. They would never know. They would never know that I was even a believer in Jesus Christ. So the question that I want to ask this morning is, is there any hope for you and for me? Is there any hope if we fail the Lord, that we can be restored to the Lord. Man, that last song, I keep talking about that last song, but I'm telling you, it was such a great message for what God's going to say to us today. Look now at John 21. Just turn in your Bibles over to John 21. We're going to see the after, the aftermath of what happened with Peter. Now think about this, again, the context Jesus died on the cross. He was in the grave for three days. He rose from the grave. Twice he showed himself to the disciples. Now they make a journey up toward Galilee, back to the Sea of Galilee. Look at verse 1 of chapter 21. After these things, Jesus showed himself again to the disciples at the Sea of Galilee, the Sea of Tiberias. By the way, there are four different names in the Bible for the Sea of Galilee and just get that in your mind because sometimes you'll start thinking, well, there's four different bodies of water there. No, it's just one. By the, in Hebrew, it's called kineret because that's the word for harp. And if you look at the shape of the Sea of Galilee, it looks like David's harp. And so it was named the kineret for the Hebrew word harp. Sea of Tiberias, the Sea of Galilee. All the same body of water. Seven of the disciples join with Peter and they go fishing. That's found there in, in the next verse. Simon Peter, verse 3, says to them, I'm going fishing. Now here's what I want you to do in John 21. If you have your Bible, I want you to circle five objects that are found in John 21. This will help you. You can use this as a message sometime. Circle five different objects. I'm going to give them to you, and we're going to go back and talk about them as we talk about Peter's forgiveness, his forgiveness after his failure. Here they are. First of all, in verse 3, circle the boat. Just circle that in your Bible. And then drop on down to verse 6. Circle the net. The net. Are you still with me this morning? Circle the boat in verse 3, circle the net in verse 6, and then in verse 9, circle the fire of coals or fire of charcoal. Circle that in your Bible. 
Then in verse 9 also, cir circle the breakfast meal that Jesus had with his disciples. He prepared breakfast. Just circle that. And then fa finally, in verses 15 through 19, circle the three times that Jesus talked to Peter about taking care of the sheep. The sheep. All right, you got those five things? So circle the boat in verse 3. Circle the net in verse 6, the fire of charcoal in verse 9, the breakfast meal in verse 9, and the sheep in verses 15 through 19. And let's let those five objects tell us the story of Peter's forgiveness. First of all, the boat speaks of Peter's past. What was his occupation, church? He's a fisherman. The boat speaks of his past, that he was a fisherman. Look at the second thing, the net. What does the net speak of? The net speaks of his call. His call to leave the boat, to leave fishing, and to fish for men. Do you remember in Luke chapter 5, the first great catch of fish? It was right after that. They couldn't even get them to the shore. There were so many fish. They couldn't even get them to the shore. The net reminds us that Peter had been called not to fish for fish, but Jesus said, you follow me and I will make you to become a fisher of man. That's what we are too. That's our call too. So the boat reminds us of Peter's past. The net reminds us of his call. He had been called by the Lord Jesus Christ not to fish for fish, but to fish for men. Look at the third thing, the fire of coals. Did you know there's only two places in the New Testament where fire of coals is mentioned? One is here in John 21, verse 9. The other is in John 18. Where's the last coals that were mentioned in John 18? Where was Peter? Warming himself by the fire as he denied Christ. So what does the fire of charcoal speak of? It speaks of Peter's denial. It speaks of his failure that we've been talking about. Listen, do you think that even the Lord can use smells to cause us to repent? We smell something or see something and it causes us to reflect back on our relationship with Him and how far we've walked away from Him. I believe the next time we see fires of charcoal in the Scripture, the smell of it caused Peter to remember the last time when he denied the Lord Jesus. Does that make sense? Look at the fourth thing, the breakfast meal. Jesus tells them, you guys caught any fish? Now they don't know who he is yet. You guys caught any fish? No, we've been out here all night and we haven't caught anything. Cast your net on the right side of the boat. They cast their net on the right side of the boat and how many fish did they bring in? 153 fish. And Peter instantly knew this was no ordinary man standing on the shore. This was the risen Lord Jesus. He swims to the shore. The other disciples bring the fish to the shore. And Jesus is already prepared a breakfast meal for them. In fact, in verse 9, Jesus says, Come, eat breakfast. I want you to hear this. This was no ordinary meal. This was the renewal of the covenant. This was called in Hebrew the Shulon Shalom, the table of peace, the table of reconciliation. In that day, in ancient Middle East, if there were two parties that made a covenant with one another and you broke the covenant, you would then try to reach out to that individual and you would say, listen, come to my house, we'll have a meal together and we will reinstate the covenant relationship. Usually it was the offending person that made the meal, but now it is the one who was offended that has made the meal, the table of reconciliation. This was no ordinary breakfast. 
this was a way for Jesus to say to all of his disciples, you guys have failed, but come on back. I want you to be on board again. I want you to be renewed again. Does that make sense? The shulon shalom, the table of reconciliation. And then I want to move from Peter's failure, Peter's forgiveness. We see it right there. There's one more thing that I want to show you, but it has to do with Peter's future. His future. So that's our outline. His failure, his forgiveness. Then obvious that the Lord was forgiving him. Obvious that the Lord was restoring him through the table, through the meal. By the way, one other reference to the Shulan Shalom. Do you remember in Revelation 3 where Jesus is talking to the church at Laodicea and he ends by saying, listen, behold, I stand at the door and knock. Do you remember what he said? If you'll open the door and let me come in, I'll do what? I'll come in and dine with you. Do you know what he's saying? We'll meet at the table. We'll get this thing right. We'll reestablish our relationship and our fellowship together. Do you see that? You see it all over Scripture. You really see it several times in the Old Testament. But let's talk about Peter's future. I want you to see this in these incredible verses. Look at verse uh, 15 with me. So when they had eaten breakfast... When they finished this meal of reconciliation, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonah, do you agape me more than these? Do you love me with the sacrificial love of God that you would be willing to lay down your life? Do you love me more than these? Now, what are these? I think there are two possibilities there. These could be the other disciples. Because remember in Matthew 26, Peter had already declared, I love you more than anybody else. So Jesus could have said, do you love me more than these men? I believe these could also be the fish that were laying on the ground. You love me more than these fish? You love me more than your past occupation? Do you love me enough to give it all up and do what I called you to do, and that is to become a fisher of men? Do you love me that much? And he said, look what Jesus said, feed my lambs. In fact, here are the sheep. Here are the illustration about uh, the sheep. And he said to him a second time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you agape me? And he said, yes, Lord, you know that I phileo you. You know that I love you like a brother. You know that I love you like a friend. Do you see the play on words that's used there in the Greek? Do you love me enough to lay down your life for me? Lord, you know I love you like a friend. And Jesus said, tend my sheep. And then he said to him a third time, by the way, how many times did Peter deny him? Three times. How many times does Jesus ask, do you love me? Three times. But he changes on this one. Simon, son of Jonah, do you even phileo me? Do you really even love me like a brother, like a, a friend? And Peter was grieved because he said to him the third time, Do you love me? And he said, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. I phileo you. I love you like a friend, like a brother. And Jesus said, Feed my sheep. Do you see our call there, ladies and gentlemen? Our call there is the same as the call that Peter had on his life. Our future is the same. We are called to lead the sheep. We are called to feed the sheep. And we are called to be willing to bleed for the sheep if that's what it requires. Because this last one, Jesus then goes on to describe how Peter will suffer. And how he will even give his life to follow Jesus. Did he fail? 
Yes, he failed. Do we fail? Yes, we fail. But is there forgiveness? Can we come back to the table? Can we say, Lord, I've really blown it. I've been following you at a distance. It's affected my judgment, my thinking. I've even denied you. But I know I can come back to the table because I know you have a future for my life. He has a future for your life. He's called you. And even if we blow it, he says, come on back. Come on back. Let's bow our heads and close our eyes for just, just a moment. One of the reasons that I felt so strongly led to preach this this morning is because I know my own life. And I know how many times that I've failed the Lord. Sometimes it was not intentional. And sometimes I clearly knew what I was doing. And I still failed Him. But I believe with all my heart that if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. He is willing to restore us, to forgive us, and then to give us a future. The call to become fishers of men and women and boys and girls all over this world. So here's what I want you to do. If the Holy Spirit is speaking to your heart right now, would you just say, Lord, forgive me for all the times I've failed you. I recommit my future to you. I want you to use my life for your glory and your honor. And Father, I pray that in the midst of this moment that you have spoken to us through your word. Thank you for grace, amazing grace that not only saves, but grace that restores and grace for the future. So Lord, just, just reinvigorate our call. Help us, Father, to be completely dedicated to you and for your purposes. In Jesus' name, amen.